love them, I love them, I die for them, I die for them. If you're one of those, lift your hands and give the Lord a shout of praise. Good morning, Parkway. Woo! Can we just praise the Lord one more time here? Come on. Praise you, Lord. Lord, we love you. We praise you, God. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy, God. You're so good, Lord. We love you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, welcome. Welcome. Praise the Lord. God's good, isn't it? Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to Parkway. Today's a good day. Look to somebody and tell them today's a good day. Today's a great day. Tell them God's good. Amen. I want to welcome everybody here today. Uh, if you, this is your first time with us, come on. You, I, let me assure you, you've came to the right place. Come on. I'm, I'm excited to be here this morning. There's some of us, we joke together sometimes we're saying, you know, how we're always just excited. But really, the truth is, we really are excited about what God's doing in our lives. Amen. What He's doing in this place. Come on. But if this is your first time here this morning, welcome. If this is your second time here, praise God, you're back. Come on. Amen. No. But listen, if this is your first time, if you're a newcomer, let me point out just a couple of things and we'll get right back on track. There, back here in the corner, you'll see a doorway. There is our nursery. And if you've got a little one and have needs for a nursery, back there is the nursery. There, there's always staffed with two very capable, very loving people that is, uh, that'll give your child good care in a safe place. And by the way, if you've got kids this morning with you and they're uh, above the nursery age but 12 and under, we've got children's church going on. Uh, to, uh, back through those double doors, Take the long hallway, and on the right, you'll see a room where they're having children's church. It's like a mirror image of what's going on in here. They're doing some worshiping and some Bible studies. I encourage you to uh, take your kids back there. They'll be in a good, safe place. Amen. Well, good morning. This is good. I'm glad to see you. We've got a lot to do today. Uh, let's get out of our seats, and let's uh, put on the biggest smile that you can and, and welcome one another here.
Okay, if you'll, for everyone to be getting back towards their seats. I want everyone to uh, give their attention to Pastor Jennifer. I believe you've got a few announcements to make this morning. I thought you were... Good morning, Parkway. I'm here to do announcements. And the Bible says, Todd Claypool, that confession is good for the soul. And I got so excited up here singing about the mighty ones and the mighty God that it just left me that I was supposed to do this. So I'm going to pull them back. So this morning, first and foremost, this morning, we are having our missions uh, luncheon right after service. We've got Ellie and Kathy in the back. We have a nice, they have a nice lunch prepared for us. And all the money is going to, we are bringing the Ukrainian children home. That's what the Church of God is working on. We, they, they, we, the Church of God was so active and so quick in getting the children to safety, but now it is our heart to bring them back home. So we will be bringing them back home. And so the, all proceeds today go to the missions dinner, uh, go to this mission. And we will also be having a dessert auction. Now, let me say something. Maybe you say, well, I'm not real hungry. I don't want lunch. I promise you it will be worth it if you will stay for the dessert auction. Because if Scott Noble did not do many other professions, and he does all kinds of things. He, he plays up here. He has a profession. And more than anything, he's married to Kathy Noble. And that's a full-time job in itself. But he is our auctioneer. So he will be auctioning the desserts off, and it's a barrel of fun just to watch him. And I have literally thought that I was bidding $20 on something and leave here owing $120 because they've run it up on me and I don't even know it. They're probably just fibbing to me, so I don't know. So we've got, we're, so that is today. Is there anything I'm missing there, girls, that you want to? Okay. But know when you're doing it. Know when you're, and I want to say this, I planned this week for this auction. I've left some money aside because I wanted to be able to bless this. Because when I watched this video the first time, it so touched my heart. It so touched my heart that I wanted to give. So I've already prepared my heart, prepared myself. I'm ready to go for this. So it's going to be a good time. It's a good fellowship time too, so please stay. Next Sunday, uh, Ed Toller will be with us uh, to, to minister the gospel. Ed is a phenomenal speaker. We've known Ed for many, many years. I think Mark's dad was one of the first ones that gave Ed the opportunity to preach. So he goes way back with us, but he's not an old guy. He's a, he's a great guy. Ed is a great guy, and he's also a great singer. So we're going to try to pull his arm a little bit and get him to sing for us. But be here next Sunday. Parkway, show up. You know when people come here to visit and they come to speak, one of the things they say is when you walk in the door, you feel the presence and the Spirit of the Lord. And we are so grateful for that. And so Ed and hopefully his wife Dana will be with us next week, and we are very, very excited about that. Okay, the next thing I need to announce is we are on Friday, June the 16th. Parkway has been invited to come to the city of Corbin and do a night of worship. We, I'm so thankful for that. Yeah. That is so incredible. Yeah. I, I, the city pretty much came to us about this. We get a free stage. We get a time there, and I don't even know how much time we're going to have. About two hours of worship. And let me. Do, I'm going to do a little commercial here if I can. Kathy, uh, Ellie designed it, but Kathy has made us the coolest. It just says Parkway, but it's PKWY or something like that. Worship. They are the coolest t-shirts. I love them. I told them, I said, I'm going to be wearing mine well past that. But get you a t-shirt and then come out with us that night. Bring a, bring a lawn chair with you and we're just going to worship. And that starts at, what time does that start? Six to eight o'clock. So come out with us, be with the Parkway family and our worship team will be, uh, 
be hosting that and doing that, and it's going to be a great night. And where is that at? at the, is it tell on there? Nick Brock Park. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Also, this one I'm so excited about. I didn't forget this one. I'm so excited. Everybody know what's coming up uh, that we celebrate the men in our lives? Father's Day. Yes, Father's Day. This year for Father's Day, we're doing a little something fun. We're asking all of our men to wear Hawaiian shirts, okay? So have these on board with us. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Okay, good. Chuck's on board. You already have your shirt, Chuck? I know I say this all the time with the ugly Christmas sweater, but I promise you, if you had other plans for Father's Day, if you thought you were going to get to the steakhouse first and not come to church, it will be worth coming to see Pastor Mark's Hawaiian shirt that I have for him. It's special ordered, Brock. It was special ordered and designed just for him. So guys, wear Hawaiian shirts. Ladies, if you want to wear yours, wear them. Wear Hawaiian pants, whatever. Skirt, whatever. Parkway, we love you very, very, very much. God bless you. All right, just, just real quick, I want to add one more announcement. This Friday night and Saturday, that's June uh, 8th and 9th, I believe, right? Not 9th and 10th, I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to be, the men and, and the boys, we're going to be camping out down at Clark and Denise Napier's Pond. We're going to have a, a good camp out night that evening. On Friday evening, we're going to do some, some cooking out, and catching some bluegill and bass, and just a, just a real good time. So men, bring, bring your boys, uh, bring your neighbor, bring a friend. Let's, let's all the men and young men, let's gather down there and have a good, good time, good evening of fellowship. And several are going to camp out that night. So uh, it's sure to be uh, an event, a fun event. I think Ray said last time they were uh, cooking frog legs or something and ended up at one night. But anyway, that maybe, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but uh, no. But uh, please come out. It'll be a good evening. It'll be a good time of fellowship. All right. So um, if our ushers can be taken, getting in their positions, we'll, we'll worship in our giving this morning. And as they're getting into place, I want to, Say, give a sincere thank you to everyone that came out yesterday and served at the drug recovery rally. We had a great day, didn't we? Amen. Yes. In, in just a short time, uh, probably just an hour and a half, we, we started at just around one. By, by 2.30, we had fed around 500 people. Amen. That was good. And that's kingdom stuff. Yeah. Amen. But if you were there, thank you. And if you weren't able to be there and you were praying for us in the background, your prayers were effective. Amen. It was a good day. It was kingdom stuff. All right, so let's, let's, let's receive our, our, our tithes and our offerings. By the way, um, if, if you're not already familiar, we mention it from time to time about our online giving. You can give online. Uh, it's very convenient. It's a good way to track your giving as well. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Has God been good to you? Amen. He's been good to me. Father God, Lord, we love you and we praise you, God, for this time. God, I'm so thankful, Lord, as we all are. God, to be here in your presence, God, to have the opportunity to give, Lord. God, you make a way as we talk this morning when there is no way, God. Lord, you heal our bodies miraculously, God. Lord, you bless our finances, God. Lord, when it becomes empty, Lord, Lord, you just make that way, God, and we're so thankful for you, God. We're so thankful for what you're doing in our lives, God. We give into this place. We give into the ministry here because we, we know and we ask, God, that you'll multiply it and use it for more ministry and we'll touch more lives, God. We're so thankful this morning. We ask that you bless this tithing offering. God, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Let's give and let's worship.
thankful to be in the Lord's house this morning? Who's thankful that we serve a God that cannot be stopped? Who's thankful we serve a God that cannot be stopped? That what the enemy meant for evil, that he turned it for our good. Amen. Let's worship him this morning. If you feel comfortable doing so, stand up on your feet. Let's worship him today. Jesus 
I'm at my end You're just getting started When I hit a wall You just walk through When I face a mountain You are the maker So it's gotta move When I'm out of faith You are still faithful I'm at my worst You are still good In all of my questions You are the answer It all points to you Cause you're the God of the breakthrough When I'm breaking down You'll be working the way
one thing I know You're still on your throne So whatever I'm feeling I still got a reason To praise Still got a reason to pray going through I still got a reason to pray Clap your hands and praise the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Come on, bless his name. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Go ahead, just praise him a little more. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. I'm glad to be in his house and in his presence today, aren't you? Come on, give the Lord thanks for that. Today. Aren't you glad Jesus loves you and he meets you where you are? Remain standing with me and reach for your Bible. Go with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. do hope after service we'll go over for the missions fundraiser, lunch, and the dessert auction. Just don't scratch your nose because Scott Noble will take it as a bid. I guarantee. <coughs> it seems our day and age, of course, many, most of you know I'm preaching a lot about Jesus right now. We're actually in the second series this year, the first whole two months of this year, I preached on meeting Jesus and about the encounters people had with him. And right now we're going to preach some other things and we came back to another series on the Jesus you may not know. 
It seems we've made this such a a religious thing. But I want to tell you today and just remind you that no matter who you are or where you are, Jesus is real and He cares about you in a very personal way. It's not just a, a religious thing. You were created for a relationship with Him. And I hope today for the next few minutes that God will give us a little grace maybe to peel off a few of those religious layers and to see the Jesus that you may not know. Amen? Well, praise Him one more time. Bless the name of the Lord. Thank you, God. <clears throat> Luke 7, 34. These are the words of Jesus. Luke 7, 34. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. A friend of tax collectors and sinners. We've talked about Jesus the last few weeks. We've talked about Jesus in the Old Testament. We've talked about Jesus the seeker. And we've talked about Jesus the intercessor. And today, I want us to talk about Jesus the friend of sinners. The friend of sinners. Not just a God far removed, but he wants to be your friend today. The friend of sinners. Thank him for that. Amen. Pray with me, Lord. We thank you for your presence today. And I pray, Jesus, that you would come into the room. I believe you're already here. And I just pray for that (coughs) presence of the Lord that comes to us where we are that becomes so real, more real than anything that we, anything else or anybody else that we know. God, I pray that, I pray that today, that you'd make yourself real to us in divine encounter. God, I need your touch. Help me to rest on you and depend on you and not myself. And I pray that people would see Jesus today. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit that makes Jesus real to us. And I pray that you touch and make the word come alive today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless somebody as you're being seated. Just tell them, God bless you. have when it comes to God and when it comes to Jesus we have a lot of we generally tend to come to God with a lot of preconceptions of what God ought to be like and what God ought to look like and how God ought to act and we need to be pretty careful about that real careful because if I step into a place of pride which is what we do and set myself above God really is what I'm doing that my opinion ought to be the one that determines what God's like who Pardon me, but let me just say it so you understand. Who in the heck do you think you are? That you ought to determine what God's like. Because that's setting myself above God. And folks, if God's not above me, we all in trouble. And if he's not above you, we're, we're all in trouble. If he's not a God who's, who gets out of my box and is bigger and greater than anything that I can comprehend, if, if he's not a God who doesn't supersede anything that I can imagine or envision, then he's not much of a God. There's a verse that we quote quite often. I mean, if I'm limited to the human perception of things 
and the human level and the natural understanding of things, then he's not much of a God because the very idea that he's God means that in that verse that we love to quote quite often, his ways, the fact that he's God means his ways are above my ways. His thoughts are above our, my thoughts. He doesn't, he doesn't have to operate always in a way that makes sense to me. Even when it comes and, and, and God became man, became flesh, that was the only way we could have any idea of what he was like. It's like an ant trying to understand a human being. God is so infinitely above us, we couldn't figure him out. That's why Jesus came and Jesus said, when you see me, you've seen the Father because when you've seen me, this is what God is like and this is what God looks like and this is how God operates. Even in terms of when we think about one of the things that, you know, even in trying to understand what God is like, we, one of the things we'd love to know what Jesus looked like. And, and, and the Bible, of all the things it says about Jesus, the Bible doesn't tell us anything really about his physical appearance. And, and, and it, it, it kind of, it, it's almost funny to me if you, if you look, if you Google pictures of Jesus, have you noticed we, we've been so, in our culture especially, we've been so influenced by Hollywood about every picture you bring up of Jesus, he's good looking. A lot of them, he's some kind of blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus. And that ain't anywhere near what Jesus looked like. But, but, but we have these perceptions. We, we, we can't conceive even of, of, of some kind of Jesus that, that, that fits our idea of, of beauty or our idea of what he ought to look like. In fact, that, that probably even contradicts Scripture. I didn't have him put it up on the screen, but in Isaiah 53 and 2, the Bible, the prophet said plainly, Isaiah 53 and 2, there's nothing about his appearance, the beauty of his appearance, that co would cause us to desire him. Come on. It, it, it's not some physical attraction. What do you, what do you in, in, in fact, if, if he was that, he probably had brown hair and brown eyes and olive skin. And if he was the average height of a man in that day in that part of the world, he was probably just about five feet, five tall, about five foot, five inches tall. He, he wasn't some big, blonde haired, blue eyed, imposing. It wasn't this outward kind of appearance. That's not what makes Jesus Jesus. I'm talking about a God, a Jesus who doesn't fit in our box, he doesn't have to adjust to my standards. He he doesn't have to accommodate to me. I have to accommodate to him because he's king of kings and lord of lords. He can look however he wants to look. He can do whatever he wants to do. He didn't just come to make the pain go away and put a band-aid on it and get me out of my mess and then me forget about it. Either he's lord of all or he's not lord at all. He didn't come to take part. He came to take over. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He came as a baby in a manger but when we see him again, he's coming with feet like brass and eyes like fire, riding a white horse, coming to take over the planet and rule and reign in righteousness. Somebody praise him. He's Jesus. Somebody say he's Jesus. We have these misconceptions, these preconceptions about him. And we've created a Jesus that in many instances is a far cry from the, ones, the one revealed in the pages of Scripture. And we've gotten so religious about it that we've, in fact, one of my favorite portraits, most of them are that, again, that, attract that, that image that we think of as attractive pictures of Jesus. One of my favorites is the one Rembrandt did in the 1600s because he ain't that good looking. He's just like you and me. But he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He looked so ordinary, but he came as he was, he was Lord when he was born. He was there when God spoke the world into existence. He is everlasting. If heaven and earth pass away, not one 
dot of an I or cross of a T will pass away from his word. He is king of kings and lord of lords. And in our religion, we've created some kind of Jesus that is palatable to us in many ways. And unfortunately, we've gotten so religious about it that we've created a Jesus. People, when people think of church, so much of the world is turned off by the very concept of church because we've created a church. We, we preach this certain kind of Jesus and we've created a church where sinners don't feel welcome. Where sinners are afraid that they won't be accepted and loved. Amen. I don't care, and I mean this, and I think I've proven a little of this by this point. I don't care if a man comes in here in full drag, dressed as a woman. What are you going to do, Pastor? The first thing I'm probably going to do is hug his neck. And let him know he's loved. I'm not saying he'll be teaching Sunday school next week. Necessarily. But I'm going to let him know that we love him. Jesus himself, when they put this label on Jesus, he's the friend of sinners. They didn't mean that as a compliment. But I think Jesus kind of took it as a badge of honor. <clears throat> and we've created this, this ch kind of church where sinners don't feel welcome, they're not sure they'll be loved and accepted, and yet Jesus accepts that moniker and says, I'm the friend of sinners. The friend of sinners. Oh God, if we don't get a hold of Jesus as anything else, we need to understand that my behavior doesn't determine how he responds to me. And what I've done doesn't determine how he treats me. I don't know about you, I try to, I wanna be a kind, loving, nice person, but along the way, I've had a few people do some things to me. Anybody else? I've had, some, I've had a few people along the way say a few things that weren't true and do a few things that I wish they hadn't done. And if they come walking in that door, I'm probably gonna have to pray twice. Don't act holy on me. I'm probably gonna have to pray twice in order to treat them the way I need to treat them and to love them the way that I need to love them. But Jesus, it doesn't matter what I've done. You may have cursed his name. You may have done everything under the sun, but Jesus is the friend of sinners. I said Jesus is the friend of sinners. What I've done doesn't determine how he treats me. Now there are about three parts of this that I want to consider here for, for just a moment. His personality and the politics and the purpose. His personality and the politics and the purpose. First of all, consider with me his personality. Jesus... In, if you read through the Gospels, there were at least eight occasions when Jesus accepted an invitation to dinner. At least eight times that he accepted an invitation to dinner. Now three of those times were kind of what we do just with friends. Maybe some of you will go out to lunch together after service today and Jesus did some of that with people who were close to him three of those eight times, but five of those eight times, he absolutely stepped over the line of what would have been considered acceptable in that day. He was invited by people who were morally questionable at best. And he accepts the invitation. And he goes and he hangs out with them because he's trying to make a statement. 
In Jewish thought in that day, they, when it came to the dinner table, for Jews, for, for religious Jews, they almost considered the dinner table a little temple or a sacred space. And so that's why when G and they would only invite certain people and so who, who met some kind of standard. And so when Jesus, he starts going to dinner with all kinds of people. And they're offended by that. They're offended by that because he's, he's not ashamed of that and he's not trying to hide it. And so there were some specific categories of, of people that he was willing to embrace that, that especially if you claim to be any kind of rabbi or religious teacher in that day, it wasn't something that you would have done, and yet that's who Jesus is hanging out with. You find him going to dinner with people who are morally depraved. The Bible says that he would be around tax collectors. They didn't like them then. We don't like them now. You know, it's just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. They, they, they were regarded as, as, as treasonous people who had betrayed their, their own homeland in that day. But he would hang out with tax collectors and, and sinners. In fact, just after the text that I read to you, if you go on down in that chapter after Luke 7, 34, there's this, he's at dinner and this woman comes and, 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 and she breaks open this alabaster box and she, she pours it out upon the Lord and she worships him and, and, and she's, she's, she's dry, she, she washes his feet and she's drying it with her hair and the Bible repeatedly says this woman was a sinner. Now, if the Bible says you're a sinner, you're a sinner. Problem is, a lot of us today, nobody thinks they're a sinner. Everybody thinks they're a pretty good person. I'm telling you, in sin did my mother conceive me. There was nothing good in me apart from God. I broke his law. There's nobody who has it. We were sinners apart from him. <clears throat> and this sinner... She breaks open the alabaster box. She's drying his feet. And they want to know when it says, it says repeatedly she was a sinner. The language seems to indicate she was a prostitute. And they want to know who is this hooker rubbing on Jesus? Have I offended every religious bone in the house? If not, I'll come back and try again. Who is this hooker rubbing on Jesus? And Jesus said, you don't understand. I came in here and nobody else washed my feet, but she recognized who I was. And and when you've been forgiven of much, you love much, because you know where he brought you from. And that's what we're praying God to raise up at Parkway in Corbin, Kentucky. The world doesn't need another religious church. We need a house full of people who have been saved out of hell holes and know what God has done for them. He interacts with people who have crossed the moral line. and I don't mean to be offensive here. I'm just describing the culture of his day. He interacts with women. You have to understand a good Jewish man in that day didn't even speak to women in public. In fact, he wouldn't speak to his own wife. The only woman he was allowed to speak to in public was his daughter. Maybe to give her some correction. There was one group of Pharisees, not all of them, but one group of Pharisees, and they were so hard, they were nicknamed the blind and bleeding Pharisees. They literally wouldn't look at a woman. If they saw a woman, he'd close his eyes, and the reason they kept, they called them the blind and bleeding Pharisees was because they kept walking into stuff. Because they wouldn't look at a woman. And so when Jesus interacts with women and even has them as part of the group of his followers, it was scandalous. Nothing less than that. And so Jesus, his personality, he's 
He's welcoming these people. He's giving them a seat at the table. and He's taking a seat at their table. And he would associate with people who had questionable morals and women and the poor. you got to understand, they, in that day, the poor weren't regarded in any esteem. And in one place, Jesus tells a parable. I say a parable. We're not sure if it was a parable. He tells a story. He says, there was a man named Lazarus. And Lazarus was the poor man, but there was a rich man whom he said fared sumptuously every day. Lazarus was sick and poor. The rich man fared sumptuously every day. But when they, when they died, there was a great reversal. That's why Jesus said one of these days the first will be last and the last will be first. And there was a great reversal And the rich man who had it so good in this life, the Bible said in hell he lifted up his eyes. I don't have time to preach that. Hell is literal and hell is real. It's not just symbolic or figurative. It's always described in literal terms. And in hell he lifted up his eyes and he said, I wish somebody could get me out of this torment. Lazarus was the poor man and he was the hero of the story. That was radical. Jesus embraces the poor. He embraces the sick. You got to understand, it'd be leprosy in that day would have been something equivalent to a dying AIDS patient today. And you understand, not only were these people sick, they were untouched because you were afraid of being made unclean and not being allowed into the temple. And, and so not only had these people been sick for years, the, the, you remember the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years? Not only has she been sick and couldn't get better, only got worse, not only has she been sick in 12 years, probably she hasn't been touched in 12 years. They've done scientific studies, babies in nurseries. You know what makes all the difference in their survival? Human touch. Somebody willing to touch. We all need somebody who will touch us. And Jesus, he could have healed them by just speaking a word, but he would make a point to touch people. To touch people. So I'm talking about the personality of this man who was proud to be identified. They meant it as an insult, but he was proud to be identified as the friend of sinners. People that nobody else wanted to have anything to do with, he is proud to be associated with. And Parkway, hear me this morning. If we're going to be like Jesus... We're supposed to be like that. When we start getting a reputation or when we feel like there are certain people that we don't want to be around or we don't want to be identified with or we don't want to hang out with, then we've got a problem because while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. While I was a million miles from him, he came for me. When nobody else cared, when there was nothing lovely in in me, he came for me and chose to be identified. Somebody praise him. <clears throat> now let me talk. That's the personality. Let me talk for a minute about the politics of this. It became a political issue because not only was Jesus religiously offensive to the religious establishment, but he also became politically offensive. To them. You know, they're worried about the Roman occupation and how stuff is going to affect them. And Jesus came and he wasn't really worried about the politics. He said, I came to bring a kingdom that is not of this world. 
He said, I came to do something that when all this stuff you see is well gone and past, my kingdom is going to live on. I've come for an eternal kingdom. I didn't come to just deal with, with who's sitting on the throne. I came to deal with who's ruling your heart and what's going on on the inside of you and not just the externals, but to change you from the inside out. When you get saved, it's not just that you show up for church for two hours on Sunday morning. God gets down on the inside of you and, and, and it's not just even a bunch of do's and don'ts. When Jesus gets on the inside of you, you don't even want to do what you used to want to do. and You don't even want to go where you used to want to go. And He changes your desires and he transforms you from the inside out and he makes you new. Come on, I am preaching the gospel right here. Now listen, you know that I am on political matters. You know that I am pro-life because that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible says in Psalm 139, when you were a baby in the womb, God knew what was going on with you. So I'm pro-life. But I also desperately want to conduct myself in such a way so that while I may be pro-life and I don't apologize for the word of God because it wasn't my idea, it was his but while I may be pro-life I want the woman walking out of the abortion clinic who has just allowed her womb to be stripped of its inhabitant I want that woman to know that Jesus loves her and so do we that Jesus died for you, that there's ne- you've never done anything that made him stop loving you. Listen to me. He's the friend of sinners. You will never do anything that will make him love you any less. You can do some things that he can't bless you the way he wants to, but you'll never do anything that makes him quit loving you. Your kids, certain behaviors, you can't always bless what they do, but you never quit loving them. Come on, somebody. I believe what the Bible says about the biblical definition of marriage. And I don't apologize for what the Bible says. But I also want every homosexual, LGBT, whatever person who comes through our doors and we have it happen real regularly. Because somehow God has been able to create an atmosphere in this place that they know somebody will love them here. I believe in the biblical definition of marriage, but I still want the homosexual to know that Jesus loves you and we love you and we'll walk through this journey with you and there's a love like you've never known and it's found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's the friend of sinners. He does it. You don't have to get cleaned up and then come to him. You come just as you are, just like you are, but he won't leave you where you are. He will bring a transformation (laughs) there are people who have gotten saved in our altars that had things in their life Lazarus came out of the tomb he had been dead he was alive but he still had some grave clothes on and they had to get they Jesus brought him from death to life, but they helped get the grave clothes off of him. Come on. Jesus is the one who saves, but the church is the one who helps disciple people and get the grave clothes off of them. And me and others in this church, I've I've had people get saved in our altars that it wasn't just God bless you, we'll see you next Sunday. I've met with them every week for a year just walking 
through life with them to help them understand some things to get to a place where they could make it and go to heaven and not to hell. We're trying to, we're trying to plunder hell to populate heaven. It's not all about this life. Now listen to me. <clears throat> we stand for what's right and we make a difference where we can. But our first job, are y'all hearing me? I said, are you hearing me? Because this is real important. Our first job, we're going to stand for what's right, we're going to make a difference where we can, but our first job is not to change the government. Our first job is to change people. Our first job, we'll, we'll make a difference where we can, but our first job is not just to get them to adopt family values. Our first job is to get them saved. If we get them saved, God will work on their worldview. He'll work on their values. We'll love them through some things because Jesus is the friend of sinners. But let's keep first things first. Does that, does that make sense? <clears throat> and it's not always going to fit in a neat little political box or whatever. But what I'm interested in is the gospel that changes people's lives. I want there to be enough about him, enough of him about me, that somehow people are able to identify that and get past the preacher title and the pastor title and know that even if I'm not doing everything I ought to do, maybe this man still cares about me. Maybe this man still has a heart for me. Maybe this man will love me through some of that. And there needs to be enough of that of him about you to do that. Amen. Yesterday, we were at the, we were serving at the recovery rally, and I think they told me all total there was about eight hundred people there. And we served food, no strings attached. I was so proud of our people. I didn't do much. Stand there and be proud. So our people had their neon shirts on that said, hashtag, we serve Parkway Ministries. And I saw them repeatedly shoving a hot dog out the window and saying, that's, in compliment, that's compliments. Because they come up the line, they didn't know, ask, how much does this cost? And our people would shove a hot dog at them, say, do you want, do you want chili on it? And, and, and know it's free. This is compliments of Parkway Ministries. We just want you to know Jesus loves you. We're just here to serve you. There are no strings attached. And I was standing out there, and I didn't, I had a cap on because... I'm getting old and bald and I gotta start wearing a cap. And I didn't look like a preacher. There's a guy who walked up to me out of the clear blue from Nashville. You know, they come in here from all over the country because there's a strong recovery presence in this area. Walked up to me from Nashville. And uh he gave me his name and he didn't know who I was. And I told him who I was. He liked the shirt. And so he started asking about the shirt. And uh, I said, well, you know, we, we, we serve a lot of these things and we give these shirts to our people when they come to our church so we, you, you can identify who we are. And he said, so you mean I got I to be a part of your church to get a shirt? People, people are cynical. They're always looking for the hook. 
I said, Alvin, I promise you, I promise you, if you'll come to church, I'll be more than happy to get you a shirt, buddy. Be happy to get you a shirt. If you never show up again, and we had some conversation, and oh, God, this guy, he didn't know I was a pastor. But I hope, me just standing here, there was enough of you about me that he felt comfortable to come up and strike up a conversation. And let me tell him about a God who loves him and cares about him no matter where he's been and what he's done. <clears throat> you see the personality in the politics. Let me tell you just a minute about the purpose. Why is he the friend of sinners? You understand that the first person, are y'all still with me? The first person whom Jesus openly identifies himself to as the Messiah was a woman who had been married five times and is now living with a guy that she's not married to. And that's the first person that he openly and completely reveals himself to as the Messiah. The last person that he reveals himself to as the Messiah on this earth was a thief hanging by him on a cross who started out ridiculing him but over the course of a few hours them hanging by each other on the cross even that thief recognized this guy is a friend. Whoa! I don't care if you get up and shout or sit and look at me right at this moment. But this guy, in the waning moments, he would never pay his time. He would never show up here on Sunday. Come on. He would never teach a Sunday school class. In a matter of minutes, he was going to be in eternity. But Jesus said today, you will be with me in paradise. Whoa. That's the Jesus I'm talking about. He's the Jesus you may not know. The world may not recognize him because we've attached all this other stuff that we said you gotta have. But Jesus said, the word said, if you'll believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, that Jesus is the Son of God, he said, you'll be saved. And he said, when you get saved, you'll offer up works of repentance. They didn't save you, but because you got saved, you want, their, you want to do something different. You want to act in a different way than you ever did before because you saw and you met the real Jesus and you've never been the same. There's a, can I preach till I'm done? I'm going to anyway, but I just thought I'd ask. We got dinner right here. What are you worried about? Missions and the kids getting the orphan kids back home in Ukraine is more important than I love David at the steakhouse. He's my friend, but it's more important than David getting your money. In Luke 15, Jesus tells three quick stories, three parables in succession. 
there is, or, or we usually interpret it as three parables. There's a, a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son, or we call him a prodigal son. And we usually interpret that as three parables, but if you look at the text real closely in Luke 15, the Bible says, are y'all still here? The Bible says, he spoke a parable unto them saying, and then he rattles off three in a row. And my contention is that it is at least possible that all of Luke 15, that it's one parable to represent one point. Three stories, a lost sheep, a lost coin, a lost son, the whole chapter, and maybe a fourth one if you count the the elder son who was self-righteous. But he tells all of that, I submit possibly one parable to make one point. Jesus is a friend of sinners. He goes looking for you. He doesn't wait on you to happen to stumble your way into him. He'll leave everything else. He'll come through the briars and the bramble and the darkness of the night. He'll search all night long. He'll do whatever he's got to do. But he's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And when others have let you down, he'll be by your side in the middle of the night. He's as close as the whisper of his name. When the doctor said there's cancer, and there's nothing I can do. Jesus will show up in the darkest hour of your life and turn you around. Somebody praise him. If this house, we've started into summer, we've done great all spring, we've started into summer, We got people out. I'm sure they will be through the summer when you need to take vacation. I understand that. But we've been having new people come in, people saved. If we don't know him and preach him as the friend of sinners, we don't have anything. (coughs) Now understand what I'm saying here. Just because, you know, he was that, he wants us to be that. Just because you're a friend of sinners does not mean that you need to go hang out at the bar with your buddies every Friday night. Especially if you spent most of your life there and just got out of that mess. That's probably not anything healthy for you. Because instead of you lifting them up, chances are good they'll drag you down. So I'm talking about the purpose. The fact that Jesus is the friend of sinners. He was not the friend of sinners in order to participate in their sinful activity or condone what they were doing, or just make them feel better about themselves. There's a lot of, are y'all, a lot of people today, they don't really want to change or get saved. They just want to feel better about themselves. Because we're in this touchy-feely mess. We just want to feel better about ourselves. You ain't going to feel any better if you end up in hell. You say, oh, why you preach that? That's just scare tactic. Listen, baby, if the building's on fire and somebody tells you the building's on fire, that's not a scare tactic. They're trying to save your life. And when I preach the gospel and tell you there's a real heaven and real hell, that's not a scare tactic. I'm trying to tell you you better get out of where you are and you better get ready because there's an eternity coming. So he didn't come to participate in their sinful activities, but he did come to share the message of forgiveness, the message of salvation, to share hope, 
and to let them know that there's a different way to live. <clears throat> and today, I'll guarantee you this. I'm going to treat you with love and respect no matter who you are or how you live because you were made in the image of God. I will be your friend. Jesus, and we say this around here, Jesus was love and truth. Both of those things and they do not contradict each other. And the first thing I'm going to do is love you. Now, as we build a relationship, stuff comes up. I can't tell you anything but what the Word says. But it is possible to speak the truth in love, to have your speech with grace seasoned with salt. The Bible said so that you know how to give an answer to every man who asks you a, the hope of your calling. Listen to me, Parkway. God, help us. We come here every week, and I encourage you, Sunday morning, Wednesday night, you need it. You need everything you can get. Okay? It's not a guilt trip. That's just the truth. But this is not just a country club of people who enjoy hanging out with each other. This is a place, this is a hospital for the hurting. This is a place, in case you hadn't noticed, this world's gone crazy. And it's going to get worse. But this is a place where you can find a friend. And his name is Jesus. And the Bible said, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love toward us. Listen to me. Every time that you walk outside and look up and see the expanse of the sky, it ought to be a reminder that's how much he loves me. That's how much he loves me. This Jesus, if he's not anything else, He's the friend of sinners. Stand with me. <clears throat> Don't get in a hurry. Hang in with me a minute. As they begin to play, would you lift your hands all over this room? If you know him and thank him. Thank him that you know him. Thank you that he's a friend. He's not an enemy. You're not at odds with God. Because he hates sin. But he loves the sinner. And what you can't fix, he can. Bow your heads with me all over this room. God, as much and as simply as I know how in this moment, I have delivered my soul and preached the gospel this morning. God, I'm praying for people who may be here who thought they were beyond hope and things could never change. I'm praying for you to spark a flicker of hope in their heart this morning that they could look at themselves and say you know I may not have done the greatest job with my life in fact some things I may have made a mess I've tried a lot of other stuff maybe I can try Jesus today maybe I can try Jesus today and what nothing else would fix Maybe I can find that 
something that'll fill that void, that longing I felt since I was a little kid. I knew there was something missing. I just never could, could quite put my finger on what it was. <clears throat> God, I pray that you touch hearts like that in here. Right now, in Jesus' name. Church, pray with me. Now listen to me, this is how I feel. Nobody's going to embarrass you. You're not joining a, a church. You're, you're just speaking Jesus is what I'm talking about. Walking into the open arms of a friend, best friend you've ever had, even when you didn't know it. And if you're here and you want to pray, this altar's open for you. If you've never known the Lord at all, come on, people are already coming if you feel the name. If you're here and you need to make a total surrender, maybe you've been around the fringes, the edges, you've done a little of the church thing, but you've not been wholehearted about walking with the Lord, this altar's open for you. And I feel like there may be some, I feel like this is how I felt. I felt like there were some that, that just need to get saved. And then maybe there are others, maybe you've had some encounter, maybe you've gotten saved, but you still got some grave clothes you're trying to get off. And you need the Lord to help you. There'll be altar workers who'll come. You won't have to pray, but come on, people are coming. Pray, church. Come on right now. Wherever you are, you got mess you're dealing with. Maybe you come here every Sunday, but there's stuff you're struggling with. And you need the Lord's help because He's a friend. He never gives up. He never gives up on us. If that's you, get out and come on. I, I, I've got stuff I'm, I'm lifting up to the Lord. Maybe I, maybe I show up here every Sunday, but I, I, I need the Lord's help with some stuff. Come on. I feel like there are others today. I feel like there are others today. If you're a new Christian, you're saved, but you, 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 you're just learning how to walk and how to do this thing. I want you to get out of your seat and come to, come to this altar. Come seeking your friend. Come on. Come on. There's several of you in the house like that today. Come find you a place to pray. Come on right now. Yeah, come on. Stay and kneel, whatever. I, I'm just starting this journey. I'm just learning how to walk. And I need the Lord's help today. Oh, God, I feel him. I feel him in this room. Thank you, Jesus. This altar's open for you. People are coming. Come on, you won't be by yourself. This is your time. He'll make a way where there doesn't seem to be any way. He'll turn it around. He'll work in your marriage. He'll work on you. He'll work on your kids. He'll give you peace from your past. Whatever it is. But he's a friend. <clears throat> this is what I want us to do. They're going to begin to sing. I want everybody from all over the house that will. I want you to come. Come on, pray with somebody. Stay and kneel. Find you a place to pray. Come on, young people. Come on, everybody. Everybody from all over this house. I'm just making a move toward my friend today. As these are coming, come with us. Whoever you are, whatever your background, your story is, come on. Come on. He's waiting for you with open arms as they're singing and people are worshiping and just draw near to Jesus at various points in their journey all across this altar this morning. In Jesus' name, let him do for you what no one else can. Amen. Talk to him. Just like you talk to me. Just like you talk to your best friend. Just tell him your heart. You may feel like you don't even know how to pray. Just tell him. Just talk to him.
orphans now have.